And now's your last chance to enter the Eurovision quiz online at www.bbc.co.uk slash Eurovision. Now on BBC One, just before the BBC News and Sport, an update of tonight's National Lottery draw. The six winning numbers are confirmed as 3, 7, 9, 12, 43 and 44, and the bonus is 45. Early indications reveal three lucky jackpot winners, each of just over three and a half million pounds. Two hours ago, a helicopter ditched to the North Sea. When their world falls apart... They found a body. I need answers as quickly as possible. Loss of life on this scale can shake even the most experienced. One woman picks up the pieces. Our first priority is identification. I want to see him. Can I see him? You're talking about mid-air structural failure. Ultimately, all we can offer these men and their families is the truth. Silent Witness. New feature-length drama Bank Holiday Monday at 9 on BBC One. A new show for Richard Whiteley in 15 minutes, but who's dropping in for a chat? If only he knew. This is BBC One. Now, the BBC News and Sport with George Alagaya and Rob Bonnet. A court in Yugoslavia convicts three aid workers of spying. Two are Australian sentenced to lengthy jail terms and say they'll appeal. Irish police search for eight more people murdered by the IRA. And it's a treble for Rangers as they win the Scottish Cup final. That's the breakthrough. Good evening. A military court in Belgrade has handed out stiff jail sentences to three aid workers convicted of spying. Two Australians, Steve Pratt and Peter Wallace, were sentenced to 12 and 4 years, respectively. A Yugoslav colleague got 6 years. The spying convictions came on a day when there were signs of optimism in Belgrade that the latest Russian peace mission had made some progress, although NATO insists it won't halt its air attacks on Yugoslavia until President Milosevic agrees to its conditions. Steve Pratt, now facing 12 years in a Serbian jail, had, according to Serbian television, already confessed to spying. He was seized with his colleague Peter Wallace at the end of March as they were leaving Serbia. They were planning to join the charity Care Australia's projects in the camps for Kosovar refugees. The severity of their sentences came as a shock. What worries me, and we have yet to analyse, is why the sentences are as long as they are, because I think that... Uh, well, first of all, I think they should be acquitted. I think they've committed no crime. But that will be something that will have to be argued fresh when we go to the appellate stage. The treatment of these two aid workers and one Yugoslav colleague is in stark contrast to Serbia's other captives. Three American soldiers who were captured on the Macedonian border on the same day were later released with the help of the Reverend Jesse Jackson. Despite this possible hardening of Belgrade's stance, Moscow's envoy, Viktor Chernomyrdin, left on Friday hopeful of progress. Later, Yugoslavia said it accepted the principles set out by the G8 industrialised countries. That, in turn, prompted a cautious welcome from NATO leaders. France and uh, Germany have suggested the possibility of a G8 meeting. I think it's a good initiative. Uh, as I said before, Whatever can be done uh, on the diplomatic front, uh, it will be more than welcome. The G8 principles, spelt out three weeks ago, called for the Yugoslav military to end the violence and withdraw from Kosovo, for the deployment of a United Nations-backed peacekeeping force, for the return of all refugees, for self-government for the province, and the disarming of the Kosovo Liberation Army. The main sticking point is likely to be the Serbs' rejection of NATO peacekeepers in Kosovo. Instead, Belgrade wants Russian troops together with some Serb forces. NATO says there'll be no let-up in the bombing. The Kosovo capital, Pristina, was among the latest targets. But with its allies wary of using ground troops, NATO has no other means of forcing Belgrade to yield. Jim Fish, BBC News. Day 66 of the crisis and still the refugees spill out of Kosovo. Today a group of young children were among over 300 Kosovars who crossed the mountainous border region into northwestern Macedonia. For days she had struggled to reach safety. When she found it, she collapsed in an instant. Doctors treated her for hunger, dehydration and exhaustion. 
but for the anguish and the trauma, they couldn't do much. In this mosque just inside the border, at last there was shelter, the first they had known for days. Most were so exhausted they slept where they fell, huddled together on the floor. But some could not wipe out the horror by closing their eyes. They claimed they had been through a living hell, that masked Sir paramilitaries had driven them out at gunpoint. They said they were given 15 minutes to leave. So they fled Kosovo the only way they could, by walking out over these mountains. We walked and cried without food or drink for days and nights, Piznia told me. My grandchildren were fainting. Those who made it this far say there are many others waiting to follow. They say there are 1,500 more still trapped high in the mountains with no choice but to attempt the same arduous crossing. Staying in Kosovo would be risking their lives. This child reached sanctuary, but others did not. The refugees say a paralyzed man couldn't flee. They claim Serb forces slit his throat. Orlegirn, BBC News, Macedonia. Police in the Irish Republic have been told where to find the remains of eight more people who were kidnapped and killed by the IRA in the 1970s. They began searching at one of the sites in County Louth this evening. It began 27 years ago with the IRA murder of Jean McConville. It's ending here, in the car park of a quiet beach in County Louth. Mrs McConville's family arrived to see for themselves where the murderers had placed the remains of their loved one. OK. For Mrs McConville's daughter Helen, it was all too much. Relief. Anger at the IRA, the pain of bereavement revisited. I suppose in a warped sense, delighted to be here, I must admit. Sort of like the final chapter in 27 years of agony for the McConville family. Irish police used ground radar penetration equipment on a small specific spot in the car park. It had been pinpointed by the cross-border commission on the disappeared after intermediaries had passed on information from the IRA. Seven other locations have been identified, all in the Irish Republic, from border counties like here in Louth and Monaghan, and much further south in Meath and Wicklow. And as the shadows lengthened, the grim task of exhumation began. It'll be happening in the coming days at the other locations. The Irish police have simply never had to carry out a task like this, or one as grim as this. And one can only begin to imagine how the McKendries and the other families like them must be feeling. Dennis Murray, BBC News, Templeton Beach, County Live. And there's been trouble this evening in Portadown in County Armagh. Violence erupted after a junior orange order march. Police officers and civilians were injured in clashes involving both loyalists and nationalists. Stones, bottles and petrol bombs were thrown. It's believed police retaliated with plastic bullets. Four people are feared dead and up to 70 have been injured in a fire in a motorway tunnel in the Austrian Alps. The blaze in the Tauern Tunnel south of Salzburg started after a collision between a lorry and a car. It's thought the fire started when a lorry loaded with paint ran into an oncoming car at around 5 o'clock this morning. The collision triggered a series of explosions about 2,000 feet from the tunnel's northern entrance. Thick black smoke soon filled the tunnel and panic-stricken survivors ran from the flames. The only thing you can do is run for your life, this man says. You don't know what to do, you only think about your own life. And this man says people were shouting, get out, get out. But you couldn't see because there was so much smoke. Without gas masks, firefighters couldn't reach the cars still trapped inside. After several hours, local officials decided it was too dangerous to carry on the rescue attempt and turned on a ventilation system to try to clear the smoke. Ambulances ferried some of the survivors to hospital. Others had managed to escape apparently completely unharmed. This is the second fatal tunnel fire in the Alps in less than three months. In March, 41 people died in the Mont Blanc tunnel between France and Italy. The Tauern Tunnel is one of the main routes from Austria and Germany to southern Europe. Police say it could be closed for months. Sophie Decker, BBC News. Now with news of another treble, this time for Rangers and the rest of today's sport, here's Rob Bonnet.
Yes, Rangers have added the Scottish FA Cup to their League Cup and Premier League titles with a 1-0 win this afternoon at Hampden Park over Glasgow rival Celtic. The game took place amidst high security after disturbances at the previous Old Firm fixture earlier this month, but today's match passed off without serious incident. There was more than a cup at stake at Hampden Park. Both clubs had to win back their good names, and extra security arrangements were in place to make sure the fans played their part. The fierce rivalry between Blue and Green was set aside for the pre-match show of friendship, and both teams were on their best behaviour. Celtic had the added incentive of trying to thwart Rangers' treble, and Paul Lambert's stunning volley typified their more ambitious approach in the first half. The decisive blow was struck by Rangers soon after the restart. Bidmar's cross wasn't cleared by the Celtic defence, and Wallace was the first to react. That's the breakthrough. It was still a red-blooded match, but the referee, Hugh Dallas, hit by a coin during the previous old firm clash, had an easier game this time. His most difficult moment, denying Celtic a penalty, when he judged the ball struck Amoruso's chest rather than his arm. And Broncos. Rangers' triple came after Dick Avakar's first season at Ibrox. Celtic might have won the championship last year, but nobody, it seems, halts the blue juggernaut for very long. Rangers will naturally have the happier memories, but the whole of Scottish football will be relieved that the baptism of the new national stadium was memorable for footballing reasons only. Neil Bennett, BBC News, at Hampden Park. Meanwhile, at Wembley, Scunthorpe United secured promotion to next season's English second division with a 1-0 defeat of Leighton Orient in the first of the bank holiday weekend's playoff finals. The Spaniard Alex Calvo Garcia scored the game's only goal after six minutes. England's Cricket World Cup hopes are in the balance. Bad weather brought play to an early close at Edgbaston this afternoon, with England 73 for three in reply to India's 232 for eight. An English victory tomorrow would take them into the competition's second phase, but if India win, then they'll go through to the last six, joining South Africa and Zimbabwe, who met today with Zimbabwe winning by 48 runs. Given how India's batsmen shredded Sri Lanka's bowling, it was a bold measure by Alex Stewart to put them in at Edgbaston, and the encouraging start they made would have been even better, but for an extravagant stroke of English luck. Elam's deflection running out danger man Ganguly at the non-striker's end. But Raul Dravid, scorer of 200s already, remained to marshal India's innings, scoring another exemplary half-century. Wickets fell regularly at the other end, though, and a final total of 232 for eight looked a little below par. Until, that is, England batted. Stewart, in woeful form, out cheaply again. Then, two balls later, India's total was looking mountainous, as Hick played too loosely at Mahanti. At 13 for two, England needed a positive riposte, and Graham Thorpe looked the man to provide it. He repaired some of the damage, but then lost his partner, Hussain, for 33. Shortly after, Rain intervened with England on a shaky 73 for three after 20 overs. Their predicament magnified by the extraordinary events in the other group match at Chelmsford, where South Africa were making an uncharacteristic hash of things against Zimbabwe. Chasing 234 to win, their frontline batting collapsed inexplicably. They eventually lost by 48 runs, a result which means England will have to beat India when play resumes at Edgbaston tomorrow, or they'll be out of the competition. Kevin Geary, BBC News. Northern Ireland's Darren Clark leads the field going into tomorrow's third round of the PGA Championship at Wentworth. Clark matched his first round score Darren with another Clark's five under par 67 to finish one shot ahead Darren of the South African Darren Ernie Ells. Else. This approach at the 12th set up one of five birdies, the last of which came at 18. Finally, world champion Mika Hakkinen will be on pole position for tomorrow's Spanish Grand Prix in Barcelona. Eddie Irvine second on the grid. George. Thank you, Rob. And that's all from the newsroom tonight. Good night. William Hague and Paddy Ashdown will be discussing the European elections on the record tomorrow at noon here on BBC One. Good evening to you. Some pretty spectacular weather across uh, southern parts of the British Isles today. We saw the rain across Scotland our way. We saw these heavy storms move up from the south across the Midlands. They have now died away, just leaving this legacy of uh, lighter rain across the northern part of the Midlands into North Wales. But uh, two important bits of news is that Gloucestershire had three, three inches of rain in, in half an hour, that's 75 millimetres. 
and the Met Office of Bracknell was affected by a lot of power by nearby storms. Perhaps a good thing you might think. But uh, the area of low pressure which uh, caused the unsettled weather is still going to be there, in fact, tomorrow. But it'll be much, much weaker. So, yes, it'll produce some showers, but the high there to the north will begin to extend its influence southwards. So, for tonight, still those areas of cloud and spots of rain across central areas. Rather misty in the south, but... Uh, Across the central parts of Scotland with clearing skies, it'll turn chilly, temperatures down to 2 degrees with a touch of ground frost, but further south, another pretty warm night. And then for tomorrow, we start off with that band of cloud and again some spots of rain over those northern Midlands, uh, North Wales, some parts of northern England. It'll slip a little bit further southwards tomorrow, the southern counties near the coast seeing some sunshine. The best of the sunshine perhaps across western Scotland and northern Ireland, but temperatures in the south much lower with a light northeasterly. On Monday, a ridge of high pressure, so most of us fine and dry. Good night. Superintendent, what can I say? The usual rubbish. We've got nothing on nobody. How do you get from suicide to murder? It smelled like murder. It was the smear, wasn't it? It'll keep you guessing. DL and Pasco. New drama coming soon to BBC One. This is BBC One, and after the Eurovision Song Contest, we're now running 15 minutes late, so Frank Skinner's here in 35 minutes, after a conundrum. I'm Richard Whiteley and this is Richard Whiteley Unbriefed. It's a sort of talk show, but uh, it's got a twist to it. And the twist is that, quite frankly, I haven't the foggiest idea who I'm going to be talking to till they walk right here on the set. Now, hopefully, I will recognise some of them. But perhaps it's possible that some of them will leave me completely flummoxed. So one thing is sure, <laughs> that uh, anything can happen uh, tonight. Now, I stand here alone, unaided by any gizmos of uh, modern technology. There's no auto queue, there are no cue cards, there are no earpiece. Honest, do you believe me? Yes. 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 OK, so in answer to the question, I know you're all asking, are you nervous? The answer is yes. And the next question you're asking yourselves, isn't this all going to be terribly embarrassing? The answer is <laughs> quite possibly so. <laughs> OK, I'm not, entirely, I'm not entirely alone. The production team who've set all this up have provided me with my own house band. I've never had one before, so welcome Blair. <laughs> Thank you. My house band called uh, Blair. Now, that could well be a cue or need a clue as to who's coming on tonight. You never know. Actually, they have said, the production team have said, if I get into too much trouble, all I have to do is press this. So I'm going to press this and see what happens. Good evening, Richard. I'm your screen goddess, but you may call me Claire. I'm here for two reasons. If you do not recognise a guest, I'm here to give you some clues. And if you do recognise them, I've got some surprises for you. So don't be afraid to hit that button. OK, so you're going to be my guide throughout the evening, my, my oracle, as it were. That's absolutely right. And now it's time for your first guest. Beware, Richard. This man has been known to take a walk on the wild side. As his name suggests, he's a hot talent who can deliver a lorry load of laughs. He's an autodidact who's so erudite, he uses words like autodidact. So, Richard, do you know who it is? Uh, well, let me just think of the clues. OK, uh, hot talents, that suggests cooking something hot. I've got a clue there. And you, did you say a lorry load of <laughs> lorry load of laughs? A lorry load indeed. of laughs. I've got a bit of a clue, but I'm not quite sure. But I've got a bit of a clue, and I see the silhouette is a fine figure of a man. But that's all I can think of at the moment. Okay, let's see if you're right. <laughs> Mystery guest, please step forward and prepare to be identified. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Fantastic. <laughs> well, it's Stephen Fry. Two. 
Thank you. <laughs> I'm mighty relieved to see you, Stephen. Do sit, do sit down. Thank now, you so much. OK, the clue, you see, was uh, hot stuff, wasn't it? So, fry. Yeah. Lorry load of laughs. That's uh, your pal, Hugh. Exactly. And there you are. I don't want to be personal here, but I'm amused by your jacket and attire. Two, two buttons and fighting, well, fighting to get into it, Steve. Trying to hide my yes. tummy. Well, I know we are. Uh, let's both do it together. All right. Okay. <laughs> let's just have no shame here, everybody. <laughs> we have no shame here. We'll all fight. We'll all fight. Some. I have to say, it's rather good to see you in a, in a jacket that isn't a slice of Neapolitan ice cream. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm a man of many, many jackets, yes. and I rather find, fancy myself in blue. It's rather slimming, I find. It's rather, <laughs> rather, <laughs> rather late night. But you must be about six foot one, are you? Six, six foot, foot two? four, yeah. Six foot four. Yeah. How many stone? Tell me. Make me feel good. <laughs> so, about well, 16 and a bit. Yeah. Does that... I mean, cheeky question. And I know you're never out of work, obviously. I know that, of course. But has it ever limited your, uh, your, your appeal for casting directors because you are physically quite... Singular. I don't think there's a single occasion where I've been offered a part that Leonardo DiCaprio has turned <laughs> down. I, to, in, in abiding mystery, it may just be a coincidence. Yes, of course it does. But I, do, I don't think limit is really the word. I mean, because I never wanted to be a leading man. I never wanted to be a, a, a Romeo or a, anything like that. Partly because uh, I felt that I, never, I couldn't be and I was too afraid of trying and failing. But also because I think I knew that in the long run, the most fun to be had in acting is playing, you know, barristers and, you know, Gestapo uh, interrogators and Bond villains and uh, eccentric people. Uh, and that that goes on forever. Whereas if you're a juve lead, as they used to call it, you know, someone who plays the Romeo, there's something terribly sad when you start falling to seed. Whereas if you start very much seeding, um, <laughs> it can only get better. Do you still have that house in, in is it Cambridge or East Anglia? Where Norfolk, yeah. I imagine these fantastic weekend parties to happen. I mean, does that... <laughs> I mean, there was Peter's Friends and all that, but that was sort of, I suppose, as real life as you can get, is it, or was it? Well, I, yes, I, I do have a nice house in, in, in the country, and, um... I do invite people sometimes yeah. for weekends, and it does have a snooker table. And I hope we have a nice time. Uh, and yes, all right, you can come one weekend if you really want. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> You've got the country life, obviously, and you, which you obviously um, enjoy, but you're uh, endemically social and endemically Soho when the, time, <laughs> when the time and the place demands, aren't you, and the occasion yeah. demands. Yeah. Is there any great conflicts in that, in that brain of yours? I don't think it's a conflict. I think it's, I think it's a piece of good fortune, as it were. See, I mean, my view on life, if anything, is that a lot of problems people have is that they decide who or what they are. Oh, I'm not a party animal. Or, oh, I'm not a country person. Well, I, I think, well, find out. Maybe you are. Maybe you can just say, I haven't been until now. And <clears throat> it's like acting and writing. Uh, acting is a very social business. You get up in the morning, you're surrounded by people. Uh, and writing is an entirely solitary business. And I think it answers two parts of most people. One is the desire to get other people out of your hair and just do what you want to do on your own and not be bothered and make your own world. But the acting answers a part of one which is being inside a team, where you're, you're not the only person by whom things stand or fall, but you can rely on others, others can help you, you can help them. I think to be able to do both yeah. is wonderful. And you're so town and country. See, you remind me a bit of, uh, actually, of Alan Bennett. I mean, superb superb performer when asked to perform pretty shy when oh. required and i think oh. you yes i think yes. you are quite shy uh, but also a wonderful writer wonderful writer but also a man who in one of his classic uh, sketches years ago before you were around uh, he discussed being a writer he said uh, he said uh, my father was a miner and his father was a miner and now i'm a writer I suppose you could call me a minor mm, writer. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I think yes, you actually went to say, my father was a minor, his father was a minor, my mother is a minor. <laughs> 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 but he did say, the point of all this, he did say, it's a lonely life being a writer. That's I mean, right. It must be a dreadfully lonely life. I mean, even when these people that want something to happen, you want the postman to come, you want the phone oh, to ring, yes. you want the dog to bark, you want something to distract you from the process of writing. If, if you want half a dozen eggs, you go out and buy an egg <laughs> and six times as an excuse to get out of the house. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of wainscoting that's kicked and you, a lot of frustration and I think I'll just watch The Empire Strikes Back again because that'll help me with plot ideas you know all this sort of nonsense anything but face. So what's the best joke that you've written? <laughs> oh god <laughs> that's a tricky one I'm, I'm sort of pleased with I don't know why there was a um, uh, sort of story I did like a Dracula story and, and, and the hero's wandering along and he's uh, lonely and he, he's in a field and he says I, I stoop to pick a buttercup why people leave buttocks lying around I've no idea. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> at all. But you often feel things like that are more a discovery than a joke. But too. you can be very naughty sometimes, can't you? And you do. Yeah. T you do you, I mean, you're unashamedly gay. Yeah. Um, That's not naughty. That's no, nice. I know. I don't, <laughs> don't start me on this. That's all right. I'm not getting all saying. heavily political. Okay. Uh, yes, you're right. I know it annoys some people if they feel you're, uh, there's almost no way of saying this, but if you're pushing it down their throat, as it were, um, and I, I <laughs> have. <laughs> exactly. I, I have no truck with, with particular kind of aggressive outings or anything like that, but I think um, just from one's own memory uh, of being a teenager that, that, that there is something that it, it's, it's good to, to know that you're not entirely alone. I mean, a 14 or 15 year old will always think they're alone. You know, heterosexual boys and girls think that they're uniquely cursed with sexual desires, feelings, romance and so on. They think that they are the first person ever to have felt what they feel. But obviously it was particularly true when I was growing up that the idea that one, one actually was not as other girls was, was a shock. It could, it could make one feel suicidal or dirty or filthy or something else. Um, I had the advantage, because I loved reading, of, of knowing that there was a world of extraordinary artists and writers out there who had been through what I'd been through, and that was helpful. People now have the advantage of knowing that uh, every time the half past ten watershed has gone, every commercial on television is <laughs> the, the gay exchange is now half price. <laughs> and uh, do you want to talk man to man? And, and suddenly the whole world turns completely why, homosexual. Why, <laughs> late at yes, night. Yeah, exactly. I'm annoyed about it. Why is there no way that I can ring? No, oh, yeah. I get arrested if I started ringing. Please. <laughs> you have it all your own way to say next Poor day. old heterosexuals. <laughs> it's a terrible life for you, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It's just awful. Anyway, it is fantastic that you be on my show. I, I've been because I know that... Uh, you're much in demand, and I can't believe that uh, you pay my little show such a compliment by coming on. So, Stephen Fry, terrific to meet you again. Thank you very much, Thank Stephen you. Fry. Thank you. Well, now let me turn to uh, my oracle for the next cryptic clue about the next guest to be guest. Well, Richard, let's press on. You'll have to keep digging before you get his name, but remember, when you dig deep, keep moving on up. When you do come face to face, you'll find he's a sight for sore eyes. Even though he's only here for one night, one night. So, Richard, who do you think it is? Oh, dear. Well, one night. He's got to be a singer. He's got to be a singer, and I'm not good at pop. This could be very, this could be very difficult for me. Uh, he looks a very thin, athletic sort of guy. I presume it's a guy. No, but I'm floundering here. I really don't know. No idea. OK, let's take a peek behind the screen. <laughs> well, Richard, here's the face. It's your job to put a name to it. Clue. I'm fine. <laughs> I haven't really got a clue. No, no. Clue, I haven't got a clue. No. Can I sit down? Oh yes, do sit down for goodness' sake. Thank you very much. Goodness, sit down now. Well, um, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just having a look. You've got to have a look. I'm just. Yeah, I'm going to hit the button in a sec. I'm just having a look at you. Oh, look away. Well, I know. Yes, a good sort of look. Good-looking chap. Man, a snake tattooed on that arm. I mean, I don't. I genuinely don't know who you are. I know you don't. I can yeah. tell by your eyes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, help. <laughs> this is the sort of thing I didn't think would happen. OK, have, you, have we actually met before? Uh, no. No. Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying to help you, didn't No, we yeah, haven't. Yeah, we uh, haven't. OK, well, I'm going to have to call the oracle for some clues. OK, oh, no. here we go. Oh, Richard, what would you do without me? Have a look at these clips. Maybe they'll enlighten you. You've got to search for the hero inside yourself <laughs> Very close. <laughs> Are you any other wiser? Well, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little wiser. I mean, I know never mind the buzzcocks, and I know Phil Jupiter's, and I know Mark Lamar, and I knew everyone. And, on, and, and I knew I everyone. Along. And I knew everyone <laughs> apart from you. <laughs> would you? I mean, would you have expected me to know you? I mean, um, here am I, 55 years of age, I'd, I'd, living a quiet life. I'd maybe a bit surprised, flattered, but surprised. You'd be flattered if I knew you. Uh, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. yeah. Well, obviously, you're a big man in the pop business. 
Massive. Massive. <laughs> right. Is it, is, it, is it massive, everybody? Do you all know him? Right. Is there anyone on my side, quite genuinely, that doesn't know him? Get out. Get out. <laughs> Leave now. <laughs> have, you, have you topped the charts recently? Uh, quite recently, yeah. The earlier part this year. But we've uh, been around for about eight years. Have you? Yeah. Yeah. Tour not... red, records in the charts. No. Posters. OK, you're not from, <laughs> like, like, these, like these 17. <laughs> <laughs> nah. No, but it's a, <laughs> no, but it's a sort of... I mean, you're not... And I can tell you're not Manchester, you're not Oasis. And, <laughs> and, you're, and, you're, not, and you're not Liverpool. No. You're not getting cross, are you? I mean, you're not going to... No, not at all. I'm quite enjoying myself. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> enjoy. right. It's the first time I've been like this, well, not in a police station, well, being asked... Like... <laughs> Loads of questions. <laughs> well, I'm not enjoying it. Well, let's look at the clues and again. Yes, but I know that. <laughs> we thought, I know that. I know that song so well. I know that. What's that song called? <laughs> What's that song called? Search for the Hero. Search for... Is that one of your songs? I know that. What's it called, that song, everybody? <laughs> I know that. I just said that! <laughs> Keep up, Richard. Come on. Who sings it? <laughs> exactly. That's the point. <laughs> 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 God, you're going to hate me afterwards, after this, aren't you? No, no, not at all. OK. OK, well, is that, uh, is that part of your act, that? Uh, no, I just... It looks I a just, bit vicious. <laughs> I just uh, carry it about. It's me lucky stick. I mean, you come here with lucky sticks and earrings and, 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 sna and snakes. I'm frightened to death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your car keys as well. <laughs> all right, let's have some more clues, Oracle. Here we go. Please. Well, Richard, I'm surprised you haven't been able to work out your guest identity, so why don't you just shake hands and introduce yourselves. If you need me, you know where I am. Bye. OK, I'm Richard Whiteley. Right, my name's Shovel. I'm in M People. M People? Yeah. You still don't know why. I'm usually Dinger, but I've got me wig off and... <laughs> I'm really is a that, man. No. Is, that, is that why I didn't recognise you? I'll play drums in them people. Yeah. So you sit at the back? Well, I wouldn't have recognised you. sit at the back. Yeah, but I make a big noise and I'll come to the front quite often. Well, what, what I can say is, would you like to ask me a question? Because I think you deserve to get your own back. I would, I would like to ask you if you, yeah. have, if you have any musical talents yourself. Um, well, not compared to you, to be honest with you. Uh, and apart from playing the tuba in the school brass band, no, I haven't. How about drums? You any good at the... I could play the drums, yes. I could play can, the drums. I can see that in you. They're saying like no, oozing the... rhythm. No, I could, I could play the <laughs> drums. I can see it. Yes, I could play the snare drum in the school brass band, yes. But you ever had a go on the, on the bongos? No, why? there was a clue on the bongos. Is that you doing that on the bongos? Uh, no, nah, no, nah, but... But, well, I can do it. Can you? Do you want to have a go? Yeah. Oh, come Could on. we, uh... <laughs> bang on, cue, Gentlemen, could we have some bongos? Just so please? happens. Yes, Here you go, Thank sir. Thank you very much. Put those in your lap, there. Right. Oh, brilliant. They're heavy, aren't they? No, excuse me. Now stick them between your knees, dear. <laughs> right. They they dig in a bit, don't they? Well, that's half the fun. <laughs> <laughs> a... I can't bear yeah, it. Look. <laughs> but if you bend a... excuse, excuse. We've only just met, and look at me. <laughs> now stick that in there. Right, that's it. Okay. Right, I got them. Okay. I got it. Ready? Yeah. But right, if you just. Let me have a go first. Right. <laughs> Do. Can I sit back a bit? You sit. Or you... Yeah, baby. Yeah, yeah baby. Yeah. You got the rhythm, baby. Oh, shovel. Sure. Sure. <laughs> I got rhythm. Do can we? Uh, well, we I might have a little. Can we have a little song, lads? Oh. 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 It's been so nice meeting you. Thank you very much, Indina. You recognise him now, don't you? Yeah. 
Shovel. Okay, well, there's no peace for the wicked, so let's find out which guest is next to be guest. Now then, Richard, I'm sure this young lady will suit you to a tea. I could go on, but I'm sure you'll recognise her and you might even know her father. Perhaps the most surprising thing about this fresh-faced talent is that she really is fresh-faced. So, Richard, do you want to hazard a guess? Well, I can see she's a young lady, a very slim young lady. Uh, her tea, suit me to a tea. I know her father. Well, the young ladies I know these days, I do generally do know their fathers. <laughs> but I, I'm looking forward to seeing who it is. I haven't much of a clue at the moment, quite frankly, no. OK, let's see who's lurking in the shadows. <laughs> Guess to be guessed. Please step forward. Fine, thank you. Yes. Uh, fine, thank you. I think I want to a winner here. You think you want to a winner? You might think you might have beaten the panel. <laughs> well. As I used to. Why do I know your father? Why do you know my father? I'm not sure that you do. You would know a father that we all know. A sort of universal father. God, father Ted. On. Yes, it would be that father, yeah. Father Ted. But I'm not Father Ted. That's a hint. No. No, no. no. Were you in Father Ted? I did appear in Father Ted at one stage, yeah. yeah. Yes. Were you in the whole series? I would have been, yeah. You would have been, but yeah. you weren't. Well, I was, so I was, were. I'll admit it, I was, yeah. Well, there was the housekeeper that used to, used to come in. Yes, very well done. Was that yes. you? Yeah, yeah. How's that? How <laughs> 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 Actually, I, I'm. I've got to say straight up that I'm, I'm a bit of standard. I mean, I must be looking really old today. I'm like, oh God, my husband says it's a sneak preview of what I'm going to look like when I get older. Well, is exactly. it awful? Because, I mean, yes, I mean, um, well, let's just, let's just get down to brass tacks here. <laughs> Richard Whiteley. Uh, Pauline Macklin. Pauline Macklin, thank you. Okay. Very good. I do know who you are, because I have a wonderful series, Father Ted, but, I mean, you didn't, certainly didn't look like that. <laughs> well, uh, thankfully, but I will when I grow older, you well, see. Well, how old is a woman in Father Ted? What's, what's uh, her name in this series? Uh, Mrs Doyle. Mrs yeah. Doyle? Yeah, Hard just... to know what age. I would say somewhere between 55 and 100, yeah. really. You know? you, well, I mean, you did well to get the part, didn't you? Well, I did, they didn't want to see me for ages. They wouldn't see me. They said I was too young. And uh, finally, when they couldn't find anyone, I was in the last sweepings of the actresses still left in Dublin who hadn't been seen. And I had a really bad chicken sandwich the night before. So I looked really old and grey. It was wonderful. <laughs> and uh, as long as I just didn't hurl during the audition, I was going to do fine, I thought. But, but uh, yeah, go on. Can I just make a little complaint about this series? I, I just oh, yes, think that on. I've been... It's, it's just uh, started. Do you don't mind me just saying... Right, you're making a complaint about it. It's started. Well, no, it's just that I really feel that I'm here under false pretenses. Why? Because everybody knew I really, really wanted to, to meet you because I just didn't believe you existed, you know, and, and I do now. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... That might not for long <laughs> after this, I'm telling <laughs> you. But I was told, you know, Richard Whiteley, unbriefed, and, and I was really excited about that because, not to be too delicate, about it. <laughs> I thought, you know, it's, it's well, well, the continuing I, dumbing down of television. I know, well, I, I do normally sit behind a desk, as you know, I've sat behind yeah. a desk for 17 years. And so, so it was plausible that I might have thought it that... It was very you know. plausible. <laughs> Darn. We're all looking at you, aren't we, and thinking, <laughs> how can she be Mrs. Do do it. It's like Julie Walters. Do you remember Julie Walters in Acorn Antiques when she played Mrs... A goddess. Mrs. Yeah. what? Mrs. Shufflebottom, whatever it was. And, you know. <laughs> uh, can you do a Mrs. Do you do a Mrs. Doyle well, now? Well, I, I know you can't I quite do the face. Right now, which. Rich, Richard, would you like a cup of tea? Would you? <laughs> <laughs> That's as close as I can get like now. Who was a disgusting one that had a lot of stubble and, and coughed oh, a lot? Oh, yes, Who Father Jack. I Father thought you Jack. were going to say that I was Father Jack in the series. You know, that was the <laughs> only other one. That's the only thing worse than being recognised as Mrs Doyle is if somebody says Father Jack to me. I hate when that happens. <laughs> but it was the near, a near-perfect sitcom as we've had recently, yeah. wasn't it? Well, I think it was just a bit bonkers, really, wasn't it? I mean, it, basically, it's as close as I'm ever going to get to being in a cartoon because, I mean, that's what it was like. We were just <laughs> these cartoon characters, you know? And, of course, everybody asked him, um, do you not think it's... 
anti-religion and all of that. And to be honest with you, no, it was just a way of getting three men together in a house without, you know, all sorts of Stephen Fryish questions being asked. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and a man housekeeper, you know, and they could just as easily have been firemen. To be honest with you, it was, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, the last series ended so tragically, didn't it? Well, there was kind of a big full stop. I'll put it that way, mm. you know. And uh, I'm sure that above all people, Dermot is raging wherever he is now, um, because he certainly didn't intend to be dead at this stage, you know. Um, but um, I'm sure that God's forgiven him for everything that we did during his lifetime, <laughs> at this stage anyway, you know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what we do, Pauline. I mean, there's a lot to talk to you about, but uh, what we have done, the, the producers, the production of the beasts, the beasts <laughs> who have engineered this uh, chance and possibly fatal meeting between the two of us. Oh, I hope so. They've yeah. engineered some, 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 some further information which would have helped me to, to come to terms with you, should I have needed it, the information. So let's go to the Oracle to see what extra they can contribute. Oracle, here you go. Sorry, Richard, um, you've caught me snacking. I think you better get a clue from the band. Cheese and onion are a great combination, but cheese and onion and ABBA, well, the mind boggles. <gasps> Oh, I know uh, what this? this is. Oh, no, this is really embarrassing. This is, you know, when people... Oh, I'll tell you what it is. Go on. Um, I, I was, when I was growing <laughs> up um, and, you know, Abba became huge, winning the Eurovision, which normally the Irish win. Well, there you go, you know, it's just one of the things we're programmed for. But um, when they won, I, I became a big Abba fan, you know, it was a real turning point for the Eurovision. Um, but I acquired my first boyfriend soon afterwards. And after listening to Abba's greatest hits and, and eating two bags of cheese and onion crisps, it's the first time he chose to kiss me and it was just disgusting. How do, I <laughs> tasted like I don't know what. How do, how do people know that? Only one person knows that, that's him. How? Well, I don't know. How did I let that slip? I, I must have been how did, the how did the Oracle know that story? Well, I tell you, the Oracle, I've got to tell you, the Oracle and me go back a ways because um, the Oracle once appeared in Father Ted also and she one night had <laughs> to put a, a note on me and put me into a taxi saying, this is Pauline, please leave her home. And she put my address <laughs> on me. And when I woke up the following day, I still had it on, you know. I, was like, I did make it home, I'm glad to say, and I paid the taxi man twice. Uh, Pauline. Uh, I'm delighted to have recognised you. I didn't at first. Did the audience at first? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, I am half. looking well, old today. Oh, no, <laughs> that's awful. But yeah. I think you're a great girl. A lovely fresh face complexion and really bright eyes. And thanks very much indeed. Lovely to see you, Pauline. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, goodness knows what's going to happen next. Only one way to find out. Let's call the Oracle. OK, Richard, this woman is nautical, but nice. Although she's been a landlubber ever since her ship came in, her life's a beach, especially as her career has now hit a high note. Any idea who it could be, Richard? Uh, nautical, well, obviously, which, uh, sailor, hit a high note, uh, singer, singer that's come to... Uh, sailor that's now a singer. No, no. OK, I'm, let's I'm take a here. quick look backstage. Well, Richard, here she is. Celebrity silhouette. Please step out of the shadows. <laughs> well. <laughs> Lovely to see you. I think my ship has come in because it is Jane McDonnell. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hey. Hey, bye, gum. Hey up, lad. Anyway, we mustn't lapse into the vernacular, must we? <laughs> because, uh, well, we can if you want. I'm from Bradford. Yes. And you're from, is it Brighouse you're from? I'm from Wakefield. I've always lived there. I still live there. I'm married now, as you know, but yeah. I, I still live at my mother's because I don't iron a shirt and I'm... You still live at your mother's? I am, yeah. Oh, come on, you don't live at your mother's. I do. She's taken me basically to roll this posters down and we're just back there now. You so. live at your mother? I don't I believe do. it. How I old do. are you? Uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm getting on a bit now. <laughs> you live at your mother's? I do. I do. It's fabulous, you, really. Is your marital... I'm oh, sorry, this, this is very interesting. We didn't do this. <laughs> no, this is about Jane McDonald. <laughs> so you got married about, what, six, seven months ago? No, it's a year ago. Oh, is it a year now? A year ago tomorrow. Is it a year ago? 
was it? Oh, my God. <laughs> and they said it and wouldn't last. You're still living at your mother's? Well, it, we, we lived in Florida, you see, you know, cos um, I met a man who could afford me at last. Yeah. And I thought, oh, great, I can give up now. And then I went on this ship, you see, <laughs> as you do, for seven weeks, and this BBC <laughs> film crew followed me around. Bless them, bless them. <laughs> and uh, so I, I had to, we had to move back, and right. we didn't think we were going to be here as long as we are. Yeah. It's only 15 quid a week. I'm staying where I am, I'll Absolutely. be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, save, save your brass, save I your brass. Doing. Absolutely. Yeah, but you're making a lot of brass at the moment, aren't you? No, I'm not, actually. People keep telling me I'm going to make all this money, but I've not made a thing yet, so it's a good job I'm mother's. Well, I think it's outrageous. <laughs> Why haven't you made a thing yet? The LP and the records and the, all the, everything yeah, that's LP, going on? Yeah, LP, 